Well, hallelujah and praise the Lord. Welcome into this place. We welcome you into this worship place. I pray that your home is a place of worship. I pray that your heart is a place of worship. I pray that you understand that you can worship the Lord wherever you are. Listen, you can throw your hands up. You can call out his name. You can worship him wherever you are. Why? Because this is the day that the Lord hath made. I'm going to ask you something special. Come on. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Come on. Put those hands together. Give your heart gladness and make sure that you open up your heart so you can receive what the Lord has in store for you today. I want to say to each and every one of you, first of all, thank you for tuning in. Secondly, Merry Christmas. This is our Sunday in which we, uh, we've we assigned to celebrate Christmas together, and you'll see that in our themes, but I want you to know that we celebrate the Lord's birth, we celebrate his wonderful arrival, and we celebrate uh, the reason he came. And you've heard this said before, but I'll say it again. He is the reason for this season. If there ever was a time when we need to celebrate the Lord Jesus and what he's done for us, it is right now. And we're going to do that today in this worship celebration. I'm asking you to give us your time and your attention and let's celebrate the Lord together. And let's just celebrate him because he is worthy of all of the praise. Don't you agree? We're going to pray for our sick, our bereaved. We're going to ask the Lord to just welcome their hearts in. They're heavy, but ask them to come in with us. Those on the front lines, we're going to consider them as well. And just a host of many. Let's seek the Lord together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. God, we give you praise. Thank you for the workers. Thank you for a vaccine, uh, possibly two. Thank you, God, that uh, you have uh, enabled us to persevere uh, through this storm, through this chaos, uh, through this madness, God. And yet you've still preserved us, and we give you praise for it. Now, Lord, let the process go well, we pray. Bless those on the front lines. Bless those in nursing homes. Uh, bless those public servants, bless those health care uh, servants, bless teachers, bless all of those who are caring and sacrificing so much. And then God bless those whose families have been impacted, uh, whose hearts are wounded. Uh, God bless them, please, we pray, that your peace will cover them, that your grace will abound in them that your love will drown them and they'll feel your presence. Lord, bless them, we pray. And then, God, we ask that you will bless this worship celebration. May it be unto your name. May it celebrate you. May we exalt your name. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say, Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we're ready to praise the name of the Lord. Our singers are ready. Our psalmists are ready. I want you to just come with us and, and, and just be blessed in this worship celebration. Come on, receive our psalmists as they come. Put those hands together, if you don't mind, one more time. Oh! 
Good morning, friendly sister Velma here. Uh, from the book of Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, uh, it says that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, God with us. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you now. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the babe that was wrapped in swaddly clothes there in Bethlehem. Father God, we thank you that that babe was going to be the connector that would fill the chasm between you and man. So we thank you today, Father God, for your son. We thank you for Jesus, Lord God. We bless your name. We ask, Father God, before we approach the throne of grace, that you would forgive us for sins and trespass, Father God. And we thank you that your word is faithful. You said if we ask you are faithful to forgive. Father God, now we come before you, Father God, as humble as we know how, calling on your name, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We call you, Jesus. We thank you today. We ask that you would continue to bless as only you can do. We thank you, Father God, that you are a provider. You are a healer. You are our peace. You are our way out of no way. We thank you that wrapped there in that babe in swally clothes was our Jehovah Jireh, our Jehovah Rapha. You are the one that heals us, Father God. You are a provider, El Shaddai. We thank you for being our peace. Father God, we thank you that even yet now in the pandemic, Lord God, our help has shown up. So we bless you today, Father God. Thank you for taking such good care, Father God, of us. The songwriter says he's not a baby anymore. Jesus, we thank you today. Bless us only you can do, Father God, those that are bereaved. Father God, heal and comfort. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you didn't leave us comfortless. We thank you now that you are healing the sick, Father God. We thank you for those that are on the first line, Father God. Those that are out there, Father God, are helping your people. We thank you today. We thank you for Bishop, Father God. Bless the word today, Father God. Rain down if you would. Let the word be so resting that someone will come running and say, what must I do to be saved? So we thank you for, Father God, our first family. Father, bless is only you can do, Lord God. We thank you that in this Advent season, Father God, we will celebrate you. And we thank you now, Father God, for the word. Make it be clear and concise, Father God, that your people will be edified and we will glorify you. We thank you now in the mighty, precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friendly, remember, Jesus is the reason for the season. Let's celebrate him. God bless you.
When these eyes, the mind is closed And the blood in my vein is cold When I've stepped out of life back door I won't be able to yawn
don't have to tell me. I know you feel the presence of God. I know you were blessed. Our music ministry, as we look back and as we look forward, God has just blessed us with a collection and uh, uh, the ability to display and uh, present before you so much. And we thank God for the faithfulness of our people and your faithfulness as well. Come on, get your Bibles. We won't be long today. I want you to turn back to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, and we're going to look at this other name that God is called. Here it is, verse 6. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We exalt your name. We give you praise. Lord, let us see your glory. Let us see your glory. We exalt your name. We give ourselves to you, God. May your presence carry us and keep us at your feet. Let your word go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Our everlasting Father, my everlasting Father, your everlasting Father. I mean, it's quite clear, I believe, for those of you who are listening and have uh, listened throughout the, this brief series, that this text, over the years and even now, has often been used for a Christmas celebration. It is proper, it is appropriate um, to proclaim and to project this passage in a way that would demonstrate the awesomeness uh, of God and uh, the plan of God and the appropriation of God through His Son for our benefit. It is what we call this Christmas story. It really is. And the more I think about it, brothers and sisters, the more I, uh, I, I relive in my mind and in my heart this Christmas story, I am amazed. I will tell, I will tell you afresh each time I, I read it, I, I, am, I am stunned and startled and uh, uplifted by this story. Uh, it is it is the story of God uh, coming and in human flesh to the planet Earth, and it is God entering into our space to give us uh, benefits that will come only to those who will trust in Him. For me, this story never gets old. The more I read it, the more God reveals and the more intrigued I am at the love of God. Uh, the love that sacrifices, the love that surrenders, the love that submits. Uh, the love that is poured out for us by Him at His expense. This is a wonderful, ladies and gentlemen, love story. And I think your heart, just like mine, needs to be reminded of the love story uh, that captures and captivates every heart of a believer. And even those who are non-believers, if they were to listen, they will see that this love story is forever alive. It always has luster. It never loses its sheen, its shine, nor its substance. 
For here is the story in the nutshell. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, I love it, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, that's any anybody, all of us, believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. They shall. They shall have everlasting life because God sent his son. But here's the appendage. Here is uh, the verse that blesses me all the more. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. God didn't come to point fingers. God didn't come to accuse. God didn't come to condemn. God came to save. It is this story. It begins right here. This Christmas story where we see God in Christ, the Messiah. He is searched for and found by shepherds in a manger, in a lowly stable. It is God who has come in human flesh. You remember that declaration. They said that you will find him wrapped in swallowing or cloths. He will be in a manger. That's how you will find him. And you know, this story has uh, appealed to me and appealed to so many. And I wondered, almost all the time, or each time I read this story, what did Mary think? What was she feeling? I mean, she had to feel special and she had to be overwhelmed at the same time. I, I, I thought about Joe and that's another perspective. Today I'm wondering how did Mary feel. I, I imagine she felt what the Bible says constantly about her that uh, she pondered things. She, she allowed things to marinate and rest in her heart because these things were too much for any human to bear. Suddenly her life has changed forever. This poor maiden who was living of the means and slow means and simple means of earth is now selected and chosen to be the mother of God. She has a child that is born. And she gets to witness now that there is a son that has been given. For she knows that this was no ordinary child. This was a child birthed through her channels, through her natural means. But then it was granted and approved and brought forth by God who declares he is his son. She had to think about because as a Jewish girl, she had to wonder about those words of Isaiah. And however she knew, or how much she knew, here are the words. The words of Isaiah are hovering over her, are echoing through the chambers of her heart. The government, Isaiah says, for this baby shall be upon his shoulders. And Mary knew his name because the declaration to Mary was that his name shall be called Jesus. She got it. She and Joe. Why? For he shall save his people from their sins. But Isaiah adds a little more to this message. Isaiah 700 or more years before his birth declared that not only will his name be called Jesus, as Mary and Joe heard it, but now Isaiah declares his name also shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Yeah, his name shall be called Mighty God. His name shall now be called Everlasting Father. You know, ladies and gentlemen, I get the child and the son, the divine and the human. 
It is somewhat um, beyond my full comprehension, but I believe it by faith. I understand the wonder of his grace and the wonder of his presence and the wonder of his Shekinah glory. I understand how we wonder at the Lord's presence and how he is a counselor, how he moves to us, how he comes closer to us, how he loves us beyond imagination, how he comforts us, how he provides for us the needs of our heart, our mind, and our spirit. I understand that. Understand that he's a mighty God, the miracle working God, the powerful God, the God that can reverse any situation, the God that can overrule any circumstance, the God that can speak and the winds hush, the God that, that, that can heal a blind man, the mighty God that can heal a leper, the mighty God that can turn two fish and five loaves and feed multitudes, turn water to wine, heal a young girl in the house, say, say unto her, tell her thy kume, which means my daughter arise, and she, that's a mighty God. But then, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that he's an everlasting father, which suggests to us that not only is he a mighty God, but he's a God that is eternal. He is a God that is forever. We talked about him uh, last week. He's a God that is permanent. He's a God that provides. He's a God that is always here with us. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe, I believe that Jesus qualifies uh, for this particular title. Only he does. He's an everlasting father. And I believe that the father God gave him divine credentials <laughs> that enabled him to come and to represent for him in a special way. For Jesus is the representation of our everlasting father. He is God the Father in character. He is God the Father in spirit. He is God the Father in presence. It is this Trinitarian conundrum that we sometimes wrestle with. You do, I do. I think we all do. It's, it's, one, of, it's one of these mysteries of our faith. We have mysteries of our faith that sometimes it's too difficult to even imagine. The virgin birth is a mystery of our faith. It is it is, it is this mystery, this trinity, three uh, persons who equal one. It is, it, is how, it is how the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all could be one, but operate in different ways and different manners, but yet they are one in the same. And so what I believe this text reveals to us is first of all, this, this glorious text is telling us that not only is he the representation, he is the incarnation. Come with me if you don't mind. Philippians 2 blesses me over and over again. Chapter, chapter 2 verses 6 through 10. I want to read it to you. It says that this is about Jesus now, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. He is equal with God, but did not uh, consider it to be used to his advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. He became a servant. He was born in a manger, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. Here, watch this. He humbled himself. <laughs> By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I love this piece. Therefore God uh, exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, this is making me feel like preaching. Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Ladies and gentlemen. This incarnation is Jesus wrapping himself in human flesh, entering into the place called earth, born in a manger, wrapping himself in a human body. It is God himself. In the text we see the incarnation. 
But not only do we see the incarnation, we see his humiliation. He humbles himself. He becomes a servant. That's what Jesus does. He incarnates himself because he wants to enter into the planet Earth and represent on our behalf. And then, ladies and gentlemen, he enters into humiliation. He suffers. He sacrifices. He surrenders. He is born in a lowly state. He is born without a house, without a home. I heard him say later on that foxes have holes. Oh, my Lord. Birds of the air have nests. But I, the Son of Man, have nowhere to lay my head. It is the humiliation, but then it is the exaltation. The Bible says that uh, he has been given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, <laughs> yes, yes, every knee will bow, but that'll preach, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ladies and gentlemen, he is, he is the representation, no, he is, yes, the incarnation. He faces humiliation, but he will get exaltation. Somebody praise the Lord on that point. It is him who is the representation of the Father. Please note and follow me. He, he, he dis distributes and displays the Father's love, the Father's concern, the Father's care, the Father who is a nurturing one, but yet Jesus declares that, watch this, in John chapter 10, I believe, verse 30, Jesus says that the Father and I are one. He says that when you see me, you see the Father. What a mind-blowing statement di di directed and declared by Jesus. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I declare that everything with Jesus points to him. Everything with God points to him. Yes, yes, everything about God points to him. It is this divine arrangement that God made with Jesus in the beginning. He is, yes, he is. He is, he is God, I believe, in human flesh. Here's what the Bible says. Uh, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Yes, yes. Mighty God, and now everlasting Father, I am declaring that this babe that is born in Bethlehem ultimately is the everlasting Father as a representation of him who is, yes, in glory. They, they decided, here is how I know he is who he says he is. The Bible says he is pre-existent. Only God can be pre-existent, ladies and gentlemen. Here's what, here's what Psalms chapter 90, I'm getting my motor here. Chapter 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth or ever, uh, you have formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting. What does the Bible says? You are God. Uh, John chapter 1, yeah, yeah, the gospel of John chapter 1, it says, talking about Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, the Logos, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning. Listen, He was God in the beginning. Y'all got to hear that. Through Him all things were made, and without Him nothing was made that was made. He is speaking about Jesus Himself. How do you know that later on in that chapter it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Preach, Reverend. I'm getting my motor. I'm doing the best I can. So not only is he pre-existent, ladies and gentlemen, he is self-existent. Please understand that when Jesus threw out the scripture, and we're going we're gonna to visit this thing later, whenever he declares that I am, he is visiting Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, which declares that God says, I am, which means I am the self existent one. I am one without a creator. I am one who is here in the beginning. I am, watch this, that's why Revelation says this, I am Alpha and I am Omega. I am the beginning and I am the end, ladies and gentlemen. He is that God who is representing the Father in the flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us need to hear that he is a God because he is our everlasting father, rather, because he is that loving God. He is that caring God. I told you, he is that God who protects. 
That's what a father does. He is that God who provides. <laughs> yeah. He's a God that guarantees permanent love. Is there somebody here that need to know, need to really un come to the full understanding that, that you've got somebody in your life who provides, who meets your needs, who will come and see about your circumstances, and a God who not only provides, but a God who protects. When the enemy comes in like a flood, he will protect. When somebody come up against you, he will protect. When you have situations and you need, you need, you need, you need a barrier around you, God is a protector. But not only is he a provider and a protector, he's there permanently. He's that everlasting father. He's that always loving father. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that every person listening to me today need to understand and desires to understand that God is your provider, that God is your protector, and that he will never leave you nor forsake you. Every child needs to understand that. For, for, for example, in my own experience, ladies and gentlemen, my dad just left. He just went on to glory and he left a void in my life. And I needed to know that God is an everlasting father. My maternal grandfather uh, years ago went on home to be with the Lord. He was a wonderful servant of God and he was a wonderful committed servant of God. But he went on home and he left a void in my life. My paternal grandfather, these are the men that have uh, poured in my life, the men that have blessed me in my life. He went on home. He was faithful pastor, faithful servant of God, uh, faithful lover, trained me and poured in me, but he went on home and left a void in my life. And I needed to know that we had a God, we have somebody who will care for me, somebody who will love on me, somebody who will, watch this, never leave me nor forsake me. You need to give God praise because, ladies and gentlemen, God just told you that even if you have an absentee, uh, one in your life, God says, I am your father and I will provide you that love to Jesus Christ himself and you will declare that he is everlasting. He's a loving father. Boy, if I had time, I'll, I'll, ask, I'll ask chapter 15 to just, just just, just 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 pour itself into this discussion of, of the gospel of St. Luke where this father sees this son. This is what I love about God. Well, look at this demonstration here. Sees this son that has gone away, that has wasted his money, wasted his life in riotous living, but the father always looked for him. The father always had an expectation for him. The father was longing for his return. Maybe there's somebody here who is listening to me today. You want to come back home and you think you're not fit. You want to come back home and you think God will not receive you. Well, this lesson in Luke chapter 15 shows a father who is permanent, a father who will provide, yes, a father who will protect. Because this son decides to get up and go back home and watch this. The father looking in expectation for him runs out to meet him. Not only does he meet him, he greets him. Yes, he does. And not only does he greet him, he hugs him. And when he hugs him, he says, my son who was lost is now found. But watch him provide. He gets, he says to his servants, get a robe. Yeah, get a ring. <laughs> Put some sandals on his, on his feet. Yeah, Put some shoes on his feet. Because my son who was lost is now found. Maybe you are that person. God, through Jesus Christ, is letting you and I know that he is a God who loves. He is a God who cares. He's a God who redeems. He's a God who forgives. He's a God who nurtures. He's a father who is everlasting. Why, ladies and gentlemen, he came because he wanted to pour that out into our lives. He came, ladies and gentlemen, because he loves us. He came because he wanted to die for us. He came because he wanted to redeem us. He came because he wanted to forgive us. Preach, Reverend, I'm doing the best I can. The scripture says he's an everlasting Father, when I look back in that text, he's a baby in the manger, but ladies and gentlemen, he's bigger than the manger. He's the he's bigger than the, even the bed that he laid his head in. He is he is the shepherd's, he is the shepherd's chief, because these shepherds are looking, looking for Jesus, but now they go to find the chief shepherd. Yeah, yeah. There's a star in the east, but then ladies and gentlemen, later later on they're gonna find out, and we're all gonna see that he's even shining brighter than that star in the east because he was 
will be a bright and morning star. And the thing that blesses me beyond imagination, ladies and gentlemen, is that he did not stay in that manger. He couldn't be an everlasting father and stay in that manger. He couldn't be a father that redeems and stay in that manger. He couldn't be a father that delivers and stay in that manger. He couldn't be a father that blesses me and stay in that manger. He couldn't answer my prayer and stay in that manger. He couldn't intercede on my behalf and stay in that manger. He couldn't die on Calvary, preach Reverend, and stay in that manger. He couldn't get up on the third day if he had stayed in the manger. But I'm so glad that the Bible says that he's my ever everlasting father and so he had to he had to he had to leave the manger in order to accomplish that which the bible says the text says may i read it again that he is to us a child to us a son that is given and his name shall be called wonderful counselor mighty god and everlasting father why did he come ladies and gentlemen he came because he loved me I don't know about you, but I'm loved by the best. Is there somebody here that knows the love of God and know that it's an unconditional love? Somebody talk to me here. It's an unconditional love. He looks beyond my faults and sees my needs. Despite of what I have done, God will erase it because he loves me. Cause, because what did it come to do? He came to save me. Is there somebody here saved and you know you're saved? Is there somebody here that your blood has been, his blood washed away your sins that he even if you go to be with the Lord today, right now, immediately, you will be in his presence because uh, you're saved. And how did he decide to come? He came in the flesh. He got he got out of the manger, though. And his purpose was was to come in in, in holy orders. And, and ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to I wanted to declare that he is God. And maybe there's somebody here that don't know that he is the I am. And so I wanted to, to, to just share this story in scripture with you that I got to get out of here because I'm about to feel my help here because I, I I am in love with this holy God. I am in love with this righteous God. I am in love with this God who, who sets us free. I am in love with God who came to break my chains. I am in love with this God who came to be my peace. I am in love with this God who came to be my joy. I am in love with this God who came as my Savior. Is there somebody here that knows he's your Savior? If you know he's your Savior, do you all mind for just a moment, give the preacher one high high five if you know he's your savior. Yeah, give me another high five if you know he's your friend. Give me another high five if you know he's your company keeper. Give me a high five if you know that when you are down, he's a God that picks you up because he's an everlasting father. One day, one day, let me get to the story before I preach my way out of here. One day, Jesus finds himself in discussion because he had to get out of the manger. He had to walk to a to to a, to a Jordan River and get baptized. He couldn't stay in the manger. The Holy Ghost had to come down on him, shaped as a dove. He had to leave that manger. And as he was walking around in in around in Jerusalem and and going here and there, he got into a debate and a discussion one day. He got into a heated discussion, heated debate with some Pharisees. Now please understand, ladies and gentlemen, that they were. It was this question of whether he is the everlasting father. I'm already standing. I'm already standing as a witness to declare that he comes in the representation of the father and he demonstrates it in a powerful way. In my life, he not only is he the incarnation, we talked about that, right? Not only does he uh, provide us humiliation because he surrenders, right? He's going to be exalted for exaltation, right? He's the pre-existent one. Do y'all hear me? He is the God that existed before it all. He's the self-existent one. Y'all got that, don't you? Yes, he is. He he didn't need anybody to create, create him, but he is all also declaring that he is God and they didn't like that and so they get into this discussion with Jesus and it is this Jesus who declares that he is the everlasting father it is in John chapter 12 verse 58 but we can't read this here can I summarize it for you it is Jesus talking with some antagonists these were church folk who were antagonists. These were church folk who didn't like what he had to say. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me, I don't want to rest here, but let me at least suggest to you that every once in a while, people like you and I, sometimes our worst critics are folk who are at the church. 
Sometimes our worst critics are folk who say they love Jesus. Sometimes our worst critics are people who say they love God. These were not people that were out there like the woman at the well. These were not people that were out there, no, no, like the man at the pool. But this is, this is a collection of supposedly righteous religious folk who knew the word of God, and yet they stand against Jesus as antagonists. That's, that's what happens with you and I. That's what happens when you stand for right. You'll always have an antagonist. You'll always have somebody to criticize. Listen, I've learned how, let me go, I've learned how to just give people reason uh, if you want to talk, let me give you some reason to talk about. If you want to talk about, uh, uh, listen, you're going to end up talking about my God. Because every time I turn around, God is doing some great stuff for me. God is doing some great stuff through me. So I want to give folk reason to criticize. They were, they were critics and they began to talk to Jesus. And Jesus has already declared that God is his father. And he gets into this discussion with these Pharisees because they called Abraham their father. And so Jesus says to them, here's what he says. So Jesus says that if Abraham were your father, uh, they would do the works of Abraham. They responded and said, and they played the dozens with Jesus. I got to get out of here. But they played the dozens with Jesus. They start talking about Jesus. They went personal with Jesus. You know how some church folk are. They can't just play right the game. They can't play the game of criticism. They want to hit below the belt. They went to Jesus and said, Jesus, by the way, we know your story. By the way, we know your history. <laughs> by the way, you can't fool us. Oh, I know you walking around talking about you holy and you walking around talking about you got the presence of God in you or talking about you have a connection with God, but we know your story. You were born out of wedlock. Your parents committed sexual sins and now you standing up here talking about you connected. Essentially, they're saying, uh, 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 Jesus, you are infidel. Jesus, you're born out of wedlock. I wish I could tell you what they were really declaring unto him. They said, you are a child. And so they looked at Jesus and they played the dozens. Ladies and gentlemen, now Jesus knew how to play it back. You got to be careful with Jesus when you're talking with him because Jesus knew how to talk right back. We call it the dozens. Listen, in, in, the, in, in, in the game of the dozens, here, here, here's the game that I played in my neighborhood. Let me take an excursion back there. You can talk about me all you want. You can talk about my brothers and sisters all you want. But listen, there is there is a space, there is, there is a place that you cannot go without a fight. And so you can talk Talk, you can talk about them, but don't talk about, yeah, you got it, you got it. And so Jesus replies, and here's what he says, if God were your father, you would love me for I proceeded forth and came from God. And essentially, what Jesus is saying is that if you knew God, you would know me. If you knew God, you would love me. He says, nor have I come of myself. Watch this. But he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? He said, Jesus is saying, you can't even understand me. He said, because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father father, the devil, and your desires of your father, that's what you want to do. That's John uh, chapter 8, 40, 42 through 44. Listen to what Jesus is saying, ladies and gentlemen. If you knew who I was, if you were a part of Abraham, if you were connected with God, you would know what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, isn't it funny that many of the people who criticize, many of the people who sit around and, and are critics, really, especially at church, they, they have they have a, 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 a surface relationship but not a substantive relationship. You need to know what, what I'm talking about. They just hang around, but they're not connected. Essentially what Jesus was saying is that is that later on, I'll, I'll give it to you, the Pharisees were making a claim uh, that Abraham, uh, that that Abraham was connected to that God and that and that they were connected to God through Abraham. Now you need to understand, Jesus says, listen, he, he clarified this. He says, look, you may have you may have connections with Abraham physically. Physically, but you don't have connections with God spiritually. Boy, if I could preach this thing. There are a few folk I know that are connected with church in, people in the church in a physical way, but no spiritual dynamic. Please understand, you can hang around the church and be physically connected. You can hang around the church and serve physically, but you need a spiritual spiritual connected. What Jesus is saying is that you are connected with Abraham by, by, by human blood, but you're not connected with Abraham by spirit blood. That's why you can't understand. That's why you don't know who I am and you have the audacity to declare that you know Abraham. Jesus says in, in John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus says, and he blows their mind. 
he says, before Abraham was, Jesus says, I am. And that just pulled everything out. Listen, he pulled out his whole card. He had it in his back pocket. He said, I really didn't want to do this to you, but you pushed me. I pulled my divine card in front of you because these are eternal matters. These are holy matters. You have no idea who, who I am. And Jesus, they knew, was declaring that I am. He has suddenly pulled out this I am card. He declares that I am. And that's that's Exodus chapter 3 verse 14. When Moses goes up into a desert and he sees a bush burning and it is not consuming. And Moses recognizes that it is something that he had never seen before. And so he holds a discussion with God. Let me get to it. And, and God finally says, Moses, I want you to go. And Moses says, well, who shall I say sent me? And he says, tell him, tell them that uh, I am that I am. Am. Ladies and gentlemen, they knew that Jesus was declaring to be the eternal one. Jesus was declaring to be the everlasting one. Jesus was declaring to be who he said he was. When you read the New Testament, I think it bears witness that he is that great I am. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Jesus is the same today. Yes, yesterday and forevermore. That's, 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 that's only God. Who could be that way? Revelation 1.8 declares that he is Alpha and he is Omega. He is the beginning and he is, ladies and gentlemen, the end. I declare that this God is the great I am. It is Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 that says, Jesus, he will never leave you. He is permanent, nor will he for Seek you, ladies and gentlemen. He is the great I am. Can I dance with this for just a few more minutes? He declares I am. And any time you hear the I am, that is that self-existent God. That is that self-reliant God. That is that pre-existent God who declares that he is. What Jesus begins to declare is that I am. I am. I am. It is in John 14, 6 where Jesus declares I am the way, the truth and the life. Notice he says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Ladies and gentlemen, he declares that I am. Those seven great I am statements are in the gospel of John. He declares I am the way, the truth, and the life. But not only does he declare that I am the way, the truth, and the life, he declares that I am the bread of life. That's in John chapter 6 verse 35. He says, I am all that you need. If you're hungry spiritually, if you're hungry physically, I am the God who supplies. How do you know he supplies? He right then took two fish and five loaves of bread and shows what he's able to do. He not only declares that I am the bread, but he says that I am the light of the world. If there's somebody walking in darkness, I got somebody who can give you light. He says, I am the light of the world. And then he takes a man who is blind and he gives him his sight. He not only declares that I am the light of the world, but then he declares that I am the door. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're outdoor, if folk have shut the door on you, they closed the door on you, they said you'll never get back in. I got a God that will open the door. He says, watch this. I stand at the door of your heart and knock. And if you just open it up, he says, I'll come in and I'll be the door. Not only will I sup with you, but I'll give you openings. I'll give you opportunities. I will give you blessings beyond your imagination. I am the God who can give you an open door. I am the God that can give you blessings that nobody can take from you. I am a God that can lift you and put you in position and nobody can pull you down. Is there somebody here that know that God can open doors that folk have shut in your face. He says, not only am I the open door, but I'm the good shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. He declares that, ladies and gentlemen. I am the shepherd that will guide you. I am the shepherd that will protect you. I am the shepherd that will provide for you. David, come here. Yea, though I walk through a valley of the shadow of death. David says, I'll fear no evil. Why? For God is with me. My shepherd is with me. My shepherd will provide for me. My shepherd shepherd will protect me. He not only declares that, but he says, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Ladies and gentlemen, essentially what he's saying here, because Lazarus was dead and he spoke and Lazarus got up. He's talking to folk who are spiritually dead, folk whose spirits are dead, folk who 
whose spirits need to recover, folk whose heart need to be synthesized. And if you need to be picked up, if you need a boost, Jesus is that God. He's the God that will boost you. He will restore you. He will revive you. He will keep you. He will bless you. He will honor you. He will comfort you. He can restore you. Is there somebody here? Know that you've been down and God has restored you. Let me get out of here. He says, ladies and gentlemen, and finally, I am the true vine. He says, listen, if you're connected with me, you're branches, but if you're connected with me, you shall live. Ladies and gentlemen, a few days ago, I went out to start my car and it wouldn't start. And I wonder what, what, what in the world was going on. I lifted up the hood and suddenly I recognized that one of my cables were off. The battery was good, but my cable was off. The battery was good. So I put I put the cable back on, went into the car, pulled out my key, turned the ignition, and it began to start. And it dawned on me that you can have a battery, but if it is not connected, it won't start. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus said, if you want to start, if you want to turn over, if you want to be able to move forward, you got to connect with me. He says, I am the true vine. Ladies and gentlemen, he says, if you are connected with me, you shall live, you shall recover, you shall shall be restored you shall be revived oh ladies and gentlemen he says here it is i am the bread i am the door i am the light i am the true vine i am the resurrection i am the good shepherd i am the way the truth and the life i am the god who provides i am the god who protects i am the god who is permanently here with you i will never leave you nor will I forsake you. Boy, I'm feeling my help. Is there somebody here know that God is the great I am? He is the everlasting father. When people ask you about Jesus, you can say he's my elder brother. When they ask you about Jesus, you can say he's my friend. When they ask you about Jesus, you can also say he's an everlasting father because he comes in the representation of God the father and he cares for me. He loves me. He longs for me. He comforts me he blesses me but ladies and gentlemen i got a close but i wondered about mary and i wondered what did mary think it goes back to that thought when i thought about mary did she know he was who he was did she know who he was and so i remember that song it says it says this and it blesses me every time i hear it mary did you know mary did you know <laughs> i wonder that your baby boy would one day walk on water i wonder did mary know Mary, did you know that your baby boy will save sons and daughters? <laughs> did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered would soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to the blind man? <laughs> Mary, did you know that your baby boy will come the storm with his own hand. Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know oh, that the blind will see? The deaf will hear. I wonder, did she know? The dead will live again. The lame will leap. The dumb will speak the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is the Lord of all creation? And here's where it blesses me. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will one day rule the nations? And I'll close with this. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect Lamb? The sleeping child you're holding is the great I am. <laughs> oh, my brothers and sisters, he is the I am. He is my water. He is the I am. He's my joy. He is the I am. He's my peace. He is the I am. He's my loving savior. He came in a manger, but he left here on the cross. And after the cross, he went to a grave. But after the grave, yeah, he got up. He is my savior. And because he lives, Oh, I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone. Lord, help me because I know who holds my future. It is in the hand of that man who steals the waters. It's in the hand 
of that man who calmed the raging sea. That's why the songwriter said, put your hand in the hand of a man who can do all of that. And that's Jesus. He's not in a manger. Mary knows now. <laughs> Mary knows now. Not only does Mary know, I know. Is there somebody here? I got to get out of here. Is there somebody here? Know that you know that you know. If you know that you know that you know, give God praise. If you know that you know that you know, give God glory. If you know that you know that you know that you know, and can nobody take your no from you, give God glory. He is a God. He is an everlasting Father in representation of the Father God. He is the Son in the Holy Ghost. He's a God who cares, God who comes. I extend the invitation now. If you're here now, come on. Come on. Come on. What better day to come than now? You can give your life to the Lord, our discipleship team. They're waiting you now to say to them, I'm ready to come. I'm ready to be like the prodigal, to return and let my Father, God, run and meet me and caress me and love me. And bless me beyond imagination. You can come just like that. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, I got to go, but don't feel like it. I pray that your Christmas will be blessed. I pray that you will remember that that child that came is God in the flesh. He declared it. The word declares it. He says, I am the great I am. I am the representation of the Father. The Father and I are one, and we work hitherto. We, we work together. You see him, you see me. No man can come unto the Father but by me. Jesus declares it all. You can get to God through Jesus Christ. You can get to God the Father through his Son. If you want to get to know him, you can do that right now. I got to say God bless you. May the Lord keep you. May his face shine upon you. May he keep you in his care. May the Lord's peace be upon you. That's next week. May the peace of God be with you. God bless you.